Yep. And then I'm here and I'm saying, how awesome you are. And then, you know, everyone bursts into applause. Noah was a complete bastard <laughs> in the Australian sense, but it wasn't all his fault, as I'll explain in a minute. Uh, you probably have seen pictures of the story. There's a guy with his family, and they're all happy and smiling, and there's a big boat behind him, and a line of animals coming onto the boat, and they're being ticked off. Uh, there's probably a big rainbow in the sky, making it all look really beautiful. If you hung around a church or a synagogue long enough to see the pictures that are drawn for adults that actually reflect the story as it's in the Bible, you'd see him looking much grimmer and sterner there, looking kind of protectively around his family. Uh, the storm clouds in the background are a lot greyer, and kind of off in the corner there are these uh, families and people kind of pleading and begging and looking really desperate as the uh, water comes up around their ankles. And of course, Noah's not going to have a bar of them. Uh, they are not coming onto the ark. Why? Well, we're not really sure. It's got something to do with how wicked and sinful and evil they are, even their unborn children apparently, so God is about to murder them all. This is a horror story, not a kid's story. Now, it doesn't get much currency in the churches anymore, although some of us like to argue about whether it ever really happened, but it has been getting a lot of currency in Australian society, in the secular sphere. We have had our current Christian Prime Minister and the last Christian Prime Minister we had and the atheist Prime Minister in the middle all try and reassure us that we're safe and well here on Ark Australia. Sure, there might be uh, storms out there on the horizon and other people are starting to suffer. It's never really said explicitly, but kind of implicitly, you know, it's their own fault. They've been doing stuff and now, you know, the, uh, the uh, chickens are coming home to roost or whatever that saying is. And uh, we are going to be safe here on our Ark. We'll be okay. It'll all be okay, just as it was for Noah. Uh, we will, of course, as Noah did, let some people on the ark with us as long as they form a neat, orderly queue and are processed appropriately and as long as we can control who will come onto our ark just as Noah did. Now, the difference is Noah, when he got in his ark, if you read the uh, instructions for building it, it didn't have any portholes, so it's kind of easy to get in there and ignore the fact that all these people are suffering and drowning outside. But in Australia, we have social media, we have television shows, we have all kinds of newspapers that are constantly telling us that things aren't so great out there for other people. And so although it was a real vote winner, paradoxically, there aren't that many people who are willing to be quite so selfish as to explicitly state that their vision of the future is to live on Ark Australia as long as we're okay, it's all okay. But that's all right, there are other Bible stories about the future, and I want to share a few of them with you tonight, as well as their secular equivalents. I spent half my life studying to be a scientist until my 20s, and then much to everyone's surprise, as well as my own, I became a Christian and ended up being a minister. So I'm kind of fascinated by both religious and secular stories and how similar they can be. So another vision of the future that we find uh, in the uh, Christian uh, tradition and stories is one where uh, it's still, as long as we're okay, it's okay, the in crowd is going to be fine, but we're all going to fly up into heaven and leave the rest of you behind. We're not going to have to listen to the sounds of the screaming. Uh, we're going to have these wonderful spiritual, physical bodies that will fly up to be with God in heaven, and it's going to be awesome. There is a secular equivalent. Uh, there's a lot of effort put into convincing people that we need to spend billions of dollars investing in NASA so that we can fly an elect group of human beings off this planet uh, and save the human species before either an asteroid hits us, or more likely we come to the point of ecological collapse and it's too late. Now, the, in the first story of Ark Australia, I don't mind that one too much because I'm on the Ark, but I'm not super selfish. In this next version, though, I really don't like it quite as much for a couple of reasons. The Christian version sounds promising. You only have to believe the right things, but different bunches of Christians will tell you you have to believe different kind of stuff, and it's hard to please everybody. And if you add in other religions as well, it becomes really difficult to know if you're in the in-crowd or not. I kind of skate on the borders of uh, orthodoxy at the best of times, so I'm never quite sure if I'm there. And uh, some of my friends with mental illnesses have shown to me quite convincingly that it's possible to believe in God one day and all the right stuff, have a bad day the next day and not believe in it. It all comes down to whether you die on the right day. It's quite perilous. It's not a future I want to put much energy into. The secular version also sounds promising, but when I rang NASA, I quickly discovered I don't have enough money to buy a seat on that rocket ship. Apparently, this is not the physique they're looking for as a pink human specimen. And looking out there, I'm not sure that too many of you will get in on that count either. And I'm reasonably intelligent, but not intelligent enough to guarantee that I would be on there. So I'm pretty much on the out crowd in this future. So as the, either the uh, elect 
believers or the uh, astronauts fly to outer space and are all okay, I'll probably be down here with the rest of you. So that's not a future I want to invest anything terribly much in. There's another version of the future though. In this one, nobody goes into outer space, God comes down here in the Christian telling the book of Revelation, the heavenly Jerusalem descends from the heavens and lands on earth. But it's enormous, it's so big that it, take, it blocks out the entire Roman Empire, which symbolised all of the inequality and injustice and persecution going on in the world. God just gets rid of it, plonks down this huge city and takes over, and it's fantastic. Wipes every tear from everybody's eye. In most tellings of the stories, once all the nations see this huge thing come down out of the sky, they all realise God must be real and the Jews were right all along, and all the nations come and worship together and it's this awesome time. And the best thing is no one had to do anything about it. In the secular equivalent, of course, God doesn't fly down from heaven. These godlike corporations are going to come along and they're going to solve the energy crisis, the water crisis, the food crisis. It's also going to be fantastic. The best bit about it is that those of us who use lots of energy and resources don't have to use any less. They're just going to come up with this stuff that means that poor people will have as much as we do. And it's going to be absolutely fantastic. The only problem with this version of the future is it doesn't seem to be true. I mean, Christians increasingly, after 2,000 years of saying, any day now God's going to come down and fix this, it's really starting to get uh, to the point where we're starting to sound silly. 2,000 years is a long time to say tomorrow could be the day. Probably the turn of the millennium was our last serious crack at saying that God was going to come and fix everything. In the secular sphere, it hasn't been 2,000 years, but it has been a long time since the Industrial Revolution. And I think it's pretty arguable, and we've heard from other speakers today, that actually technology seems to be better at widening the gap between rich and poor people than it is at closing it. It appears that it's really not true that if you set up a corporation to make money for shareholders, that they are likely to bring about a more just and equitable society for the poor in particular. So sadly, as fantastic as that vision of the future is, it just doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Don't do that, Tom. Not surprisingly, there's a fourth story. And you've heard quite a few elements of it today. In the uh, secular sphere, the transition movement talks about energy descent pathways. So they say, we don't want an apocalypse or only a few people are okay, and we just don't believe in this utopia where corporations are going to fix it all for us. We need an energy descent pathway. And basically that means if your lifestyle, like mine, is propped up by a lot of energy and resources, we're going to have to use significantly less of it and poorer people will therefore get access to more of it. It's the kind of story that poor people love to hear and rich people are not so keen on. It's the kind of story you need to come here to hear speakers talk about every now and then to get really inspired to go, yeah, that's right, that really is what we need to be doing. I guess in the Christian sphere, the equivalent would probably be called something like trying to actually be a Christian or uh, doing something that Jesus said. Equally uh, unpopular, particularly amongst those of us who have lots of resources. Again, most of the stuff Jesus said goes down a treat in poor countries, not so hot on it here in wealthy countries. And, and to me, that's one of the most interesting parallels. We kind of, we know we need these energy descent pathways. We're hearing about all kinds of solutions here, and part of our brain's going, yeah, absolutely. And some part of us, if not now, then sometime over the next few weeks, will be going, oh, gee, you know, if I can find someone to distract myself from that, that would be awesome. Let me share with you, I think, a couple of things that Christians have learned about this dilemma over the last 2,000 years. We've had 2,000 years to make mistakes. Hopefully we've learned a couple of things out of it. The environment movement probably has more like 200 years to make these same mistakes. And uh, we're well into that 200 years by now, I should say. We might have a decade left. So what do we do as Christians? Well, we come together and we tell each other the same stories over and over again. One of the things that really disturbs me as someone who preaches quite often is that I'm talking to people that have probably heard someone talk about the same story at least five times in their lifetime, maybe ten. Why do we do that? Well, we do it because there are so many other stories out there that want to convince us that we are worth what we consume, that we don't have to worry about the poor, that everything we're doing is just fine, and that we should just watch some TV and relax and go back to sleep. We need to hear these stories over and over again, and we need to tell the stories and have a chance to talk about how we fit into the story. And it just does seem that when you stop doing it, you kind of eventually manage to convince yourself to lose interest. So days like today are incredibly important. Not just once, but dozens of times. And many of us here have been to many events like this, and we kind of know that we need to be re-reminded of the stuff that we know is important. 
over and over again. So it's important to kind of hear these good words and to speak these good words. Of course, it's also important to do something about them. Another thing that Christians have been really good at, and Protestants in particular, is coming up with the most important thing and starting an argument about it with whoever it is that's sitting next to you till you get to the point where you refuse to talk to each other anymore because they don't see the most important thing the way you do. It's awesome. We now have more Protestant denominations than there are stars in the visible sky. I think that is quite an achievement. I think it's a path that the environment movement can ill afford to go down. However, all of us have things that are really important to us and uh, many of us have thought about you know, the one or two things so much that we know the best and most perfect way to do it. And it's unlikely that many people are going to quite agree with us because we all also compromise constantly. There are thousands of things I've compromised about in my life, as we all do. Unless we can all collaborate and cooperate with each other, regardless of the fact that we have different things that we're focusing on and maybe even don't hold them to be particularly important, but as long as we're all heading in that same direction of this energy descent pathway, um, we're not going to get to the kind of future that we've been talking about today. So uh, let's not set the number of Protestant denominations as the number of uh, environmental movements in the world, or Belgium for that matter. Thirdly, I should have said something about the Samaritan earlier, all right. <laughs> oh, the other thing about the compromises is one of the reasons that we meet as Christians constantly is because we do compromise and want to compromise continuously and we need to be re-challenged not to. A third thing, I guess, comes back to the stories that I've been telling, all of which tend to get to this point where there's an in-crowd and the out-crowd, and the encouragement is that as long as we're okay, it's all okay. And as you've seen, they're embedded in the Christian tradition and in secular society. But one of the stories that Jesus told was about the Samaritan, and uh, everyone knows the story of the Good Samaritan, or at least they've heard of the Good Samaritan, and might even think that's a good thing to be. And the basic story is this guy gets beaten up and left for dead on the side of the road. A priest who is good at hearing good words and repeating good words to people and very wise, uh, is a valuable member of his community, but he hears lots of good talks, he gives lots of good talks, but he doesn't actually do anything practical. The second guy, the Levite, who's responsible for looking after the temple and maintaining purity and keeping people focused on what's important, is really good at that job, but his definition of what's important becomes so narrow that he doesn't dare get entangled in whatever's going on over here in case it's not quite his thing. The third person that comes along is the Good Samaritan, who, of course, helps the guy. Everybody knows the Good Samaritans are good. Apart from Jesus' audience, this was probably the worst story he ever told, because everyone knows that Samaritans aren't good. Samaritans suck. If you're a Jewish person, you know that Samaritans are terrible. And Jesus' Jewish disciples had just wanted to burn one of their villages to the ground because they refused to show them hospitality. When Jesus makes a Samaritan the hero of the story, it's the most offensive thing that he says in his entire life. What do we learn from that? Well, I think the main learning from that, given that this is a story where Jesus has just been asked, how do we get to the future? And he makes the most reviled person the hero, is that unless we can look at the kinds of people in society who we can't stand and revile and maybe wouldn't want to put out if they were on fire, and acknowledge that they do good stuff as well and call a good deed, a good deed, and be willing to learn from them about how to get into the future, we're probably not going to make it. And finally, unless we want to include those people in our future with us, then we're in one of those stories that we've already rejected. We need to be working for a future where the worst people, the people we would least like to see there, are front and centre in the future with us, even if they wouldn't want to see us there themselves. And I'll tighten that up wow. tomorrow. <laughs>